worked with the homeless in Dublin, even 10 years ago, that there was less homeless people than there were people working at quite uh, large salaries in the organisations that were dealing with homelessness. And I know that's not the case now, um, but th there's an argument there, and I I'd like to see that because some of the broader points that you make, which are obviously correct, uh, some of them would have been made by the housing agency who are looking at a strategic view and that, that type of thing. So, uh, as I say, I'm not in any way mean in a, in a derogatory way, but I, I just... I don't see how it fits. I think it's something that needs Mr. to be. We'll afford Mr. Yeah. McManus the opportunity to explain. I suppose the specific role. And I suppose what you're getting at is the, what do they do that's different than what a local authority might be doing, and where. And would it fit. not be more and efficient they, for a local and, authority and, to do it as a collective body that has that organised structure there already? You know. Mr. Okay. McManus. Uh, thanks, Chair. Thanks, Chair, for that. <coughs> to address some of Ely's comments. Uh, in, in, in essence, actually, the Housing Association were here before the formation of the state. The Ivy Trust in Dublin was the, the early initiative of voluntary housing in Dublin for the working class, and they provided uh, social housing prior to the local authority had a strong role from the 1920s. So the history of, of housing association, not even in Ireland, Deputy, is through the European Union, housing association predate public authorities who are very generic. They do many things. They do housing, they do planning, they, uh, they do finance. And housing associations in Ireland and other countries, they're dedicated towards housing management and housing provision. That's their focus. Uh, in, in providing housing, uh, but certainly uh, their, their added value is that they, they have a long-term commitment to the areas to provide rental housing and also supports, now in terms of the local authorities, local authorities may not have had uh, the sort of focus on supports, as housing and supports, whether it's for homelessness, elderly, people with disabilities, that's the, initially housing associations after the 1920s would have a niche area providing for special needs groups and that was well catered for because local authorities at that time felt they wouldn't have the strands of expertise provided for these client groups. But you're not talking about just the bricks and mortar, you're talking about also the support side. Now, in, in, ter in terms of uh, the scale of housing associations, they're basically stra uh, stranded into three groups, tier one, tier two and three, tier three. The majority of the 30,000 homes are managed by uh, probably about 15 housing associations, uh, larger ones under what they call tier three, it's a regulation level. A smaller housing association, what they call Tier 1, there are probably about 180 of those. They don't have any staff. Most of them are voluntary. They start from the ground up. They may have a site from the local parish council, got the capital assistance scheme, as mentioned to Deputy Hardy, and provided housing. So there will be no staff in place. They would have a board. And one of the big challenges that we've been doing over the last couple of years is trying to consolidate some of those associations that some of the older board members uh, have moved on, so we're trying to get a structure in place to help to consolidate the sector, and that has happened. There have been a number of mergers and coming together with these voluntary housing associations, but a lot of them don't have any staff at all. They may have occasional caretakers that come down, but there's no CEOs, there's no director of finance. They're in the tier threes. Tier threes, and we can get the numbers from the regulation office, and many people are employed in tier threes, but that's where the bulk of the staff in the sector uh, are employed, whether it's finance directors or uh, CEOs. But for the small voluntary organisations, you wouldn't have the rental income. Of the ones who do, of, of the big ones, how many are you talking about? How many offices, how many staff, how many CEOs? Well, of the 15 tier threes, uh, a lot of those would have uh, probably CEOs or, or, or directors in terms of their stocks. The largest body is probably about 5,000 properties. Two largest bodies have almost 10,000 in total. And they would have significant staff, both housing staff and support staff, you know, for tenants and education programmes is another uh, issue that uh, housing associations provide, not just the housing support, but you know, with social programmes. We'll get, get into the details in relation to uh, many staff are employed from that side, but the larger tier threes who have stock, they would employ staff. The larger you get as an association, uh, you would have employed, you have to employ staff for uh, various issues. But even for the, some mid-sized housing associations, maybe of three or four hundred units, they've even come together to amalgamate, because the key thing now is, if you're raising private finance, you need scale. For financial bodies, they'll look for scale and competency uh, to access finance. So, uh, can you that information, can you, of you the cost, the staff, the, the premises, side, all that? Yeah, yeah, okay. You haven't got okay. Uh, Deputy O'Dowd. Thank you. I apologise for being late. Uh, I just was impressed with what I heard, and I like what you're saying there from my own uh, perspective of it. But just just to say, just a couple of points. Um, you spoke about housing aid for you know older for, for older people, people who are as they, as they age need more more supports. And I don't know if you're 
aware of the Great Northern Haven in County Loud, which is a fantastic centre. Perhaps, Chairman, we might be able to visit there. It's where, where they, they have something like, um, I think it's about 12, is it 12 apartments, and people, as they get older, go, live in there, but they have, they have technological assistance in terms of uh, sensors in the, you know, if they get up late at night, you know, the light automatic goes on in the bathroom. If the water spills over in the in the bath or in the you know down in the kitchen, there's a, an alarm goes off. They can in, be interrogated um, medically in terms of did you take your pills today, Mary? Let's check your blood pressure there. That's the sort of uh, wonderful work I think that's needed in the future, and I I, I just I I like that. And I think it's good. The other thing I like is. Uh, where housing associates, they can add and build on a community. In other words, if you have people in the community who are dedicated to a voluntary body or to an ideal, you know, they can do a lot more than the local authority. And I think, uh, notwithstanding, and I, I understand where Claire is coming from, and I'm not disagreeing with her, I see a great improved role for voluntary associations because you can open doors for other people that the local authority would never be able to open, and you can assist and help. So the question I have is, um, in terms of the deficit that we talk about nationally percentage-wise in social housing and the, the limitations that there are on local authorities, uh, you know, and the, the bureaucracy, for want of a, a better word, how, how, how could you see a breakthrough coming? Like, what more can you do to add value, get more housing done? Uh, and can I just finally... Um, I was in Ring Zen some years ago, and there was two ladies there who I think there was just two of them. It's down on almost on the point beside the you know the the uh, the toll bridge. They built something like I think about a hundred apartments there. They built it for under two hundred thousand. When in that area, commercial developers were building for double that cost. And isn't it a fact that if we're talking about uh, getting commercial people back into the business. They're not coming in right now, but if we can get voluntary people up and working and support them, they can build far cheaper. They'll have much greater support from, from statutory agencies. And do you see, or what new initiative could there be there? If that's too, too long-winded a question, if you can come back afterwards or just send us a submission on it. But I think, I think you know, the, the bridgehead that you can bring to this is, I think it's, it's hugely important and it could get through a lot of red tape, I think. Thank you, Deputy. Um, I just want to um, come back to you in relation specifically into um, on the housing for the elderly. Um, the scheme that uh, you mentioned up in Barrack Street and the Great Northern Haven is just one example of the type of scheme. Now, that's, that's particularly unique in terms of the technology that's wrapped around and, and included and installed in, the, in that particular scheme. But that's one of an example of, of schemes throughout um, towns and villages and parishes um, across the country that would be specifically um, in the centre of the town, run by a voluntary board, it pulls in, um, they pull in volunteers, you know what I mean, that sort of link in um, the wider community services. And as um, Justin said earlier, um, those people that were housed either off the waiting list or who maybe were living um, from in the 25% that um, Deputy Harty mentioned, um, th that, has, that gave some housing associations the scope to be able to um, house someone within that scheme that may not have qualified for social housing um, in the traditional sense, but may have been may have had an asset but been living in a very in very poor conditions but you know um, had had you know land effectively so it's it's that type of scope that has made those schemes work and um in terms of the uh, beyond the the bricks and mortar um what has what has been um, happening over the years is that um, the community supports that are provided and, and to the tenants within those schemes um, are provided either by volunteers or the wider community. And um, the housing association have primarily absorbed that cost. And what has happened is as people are ageing in place and in these schemes, you know, um, they may have gone in kind of age 60, 65, um, that option in terms of the additional care and supports that they um, require um, is becoming um, a bigger issue because they may not need medical or nursing care. It's a housing 
housing related support and that's what Justin mentioned there in terms of the assisted independent living scheme that we're, um, we're, we're trying to um, call for um, because it's that um, type of support that will allow those people to age in place in their communities and avoid residential or nursing care um, until the time is essential that they might access that. So, so I suppose that's uh, one of the niche areas, I would say, in terms of what makes the sector unique. It is that um, the specialisms around housing for older people, housing for people with disability and provision for um, uh, you know, homeless individuals as well, and the additional supports um, uh, around that. <laughs> Just, just um, because a lot of people don't know, unless you're actually involved in this, so you don't know about it, okay? So what I'm really getting at is the point that how can we generate uh, more people to get involved or have more startups uh, like 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 what you're talking about? You know, what what do we need to add? Uh, you know, to the mix to you know to, to yeah. I mean, I think a key aspect of the submission we made is about the availability of land and land being yeah. made available to the sector. Yeah. I mean, at the moment, it's a very difficult market for anybody to acquire properties in. Uh, that's just, particularly in the Dublin area, maybe tr not as true outside of Dublin, right? Uh, so land availability from public lands being made available to us to undertake design and build is critical, right? Uh, the funding mechanism is evolving. We're, we're getting more attuned with that. There's more people in the sector now borrowing from the housing finance agency to undertake acquisitions and design and build. And that, you know, there's projected growth on that. One of the things we would think, and it did occur uh, when Minister Bobby Malloy was a Minister for Housing many years ago, that there was a centralised unit in the Department of Environment that dealt specifically with the sector. I mean, we, we've said this to the department. At the moment, we deal with seven principal officers, right? We'd feel if it was coordinated for under one principal officer for our activity, it would possibly enable a, a, a processing of application, delivery and funding, right? Uh, so we think they would be some of the, some of the enablers that could make delivery more possible, yeah. right? We're, we, we are also... I mean, to respond partly to Deputy Daly, I mean, we... we, we for the large, I mean, there, there's some, there will be a process of amalgamation among smaller or larger housing associations in the next number of years. It'll just that some of that will be determined by the financing basis of it, right? Our key performance indicators are very much advanced of what generally is with the local authority sector. We are dedicated housing providers. We provide a housing of it, uh, and I think some of our performance measurement is very positive. And. So that's in a kind of saying where we believe we can give added value in terms of what we do, not, not and complement what the local authorities are doing. We're not, we're not, we're, we don't want to compete. I mean, previously there was always a kind of a competition of funding between the local authorities and the approved housing sector. We see ourselves working in partnership with them, not against each other, but to enable delivery together. And we think that's really, really that has to be that has to be the way to enhance delivery. Specifically, yeah. Brian, just before I go to Deputy yeah. Coppinger, on that point, yeah. um, I was taken in your opening statement, you referred specifically that you had the design uh, and build capacity. Yes. And you've now clearly, clearly identified that the land is the issue. Yes. Now, across some of the local authorities in Dublin, there are land banks available. So I suppose, what's the interaction with the local authorities to access those lands? Or how, how do you, you know, you've clearly identified what your obstacle is in yes. terms of its land, yes. uh, but yet local authorities have land, some of its own, some of it not. Yes. Okay. So that engagement, please. Well, just, I mean, I don't like and share this. I mean, one of the things the housing agency was meant to do was try and give an inventory of public lands. Wasn't that, would that be part of the social housing strategy 2020? It was for the development of land in Dublin, which is recognised as being critical, the, the availability of public lands by whom whoever was to be identified and to see what its use could be. That has not been completed, as I would understand it. So we think that's important, right? In fairness to the local authorities, and Donald can outline this, uh, you know, in terms of different AHBs going to a local authority, you know, there's possible issues of procurement there, so they want to get a framework process in place whereby there's reasonable equity of, and, and, and assessment of people's capacity to deliver. And they've set up a framework process on, or they've set up a protocol on that now, Donald, which Donald will outline here, yeah. Yeah, yes, sure. There's a communication protocol between local authorities and AHBEs on the different types of housing development they undertake, whether it's new build on local authority sites, whether it's uh, developer-led initiatives, whether it's Part 5 or a housing association's own land. <clears throat> now, for one of those uh, areas, local authority-owned land, obviously some local authorities are, have their own programmes they want to develop at the same time, so uh, there may be 
uh, less land available. The other context could be that some local authorities have historical debt on the land. Some of the land was put into the land aggregation scheme, so there may be costs in, uh, incurred with that. The housing associations in the past tended to have bilateral discussions with local authorities to, to see, look, would this housing be suitable for this local authority in this area? Now it's gone through a more structured protocol that if there is a site available, the local authority will contact a number of associations to see what's the best fit um, for the site, and also it's more transparent in terms of who, who gets the site. But really, in the past, the low-cost size scheme was a real trigger that local authorities had. It was a real uh, trigger for our sector and for, also for people building their own homes, the low-cost subsidised size scheme. There were thousands of sites provided uh, for our sector, and it, it worked well. Now, that scheme has sort of uh, diminished over recent years, and we're trying to get something like that activated. But I think the mapping exercise the housing... Agency, you're trying to get something like that activated. Where is that in the process at the moment? At, at the moment, it's, it's not in the process. It, it used to turn up in the statistics every year, every quarter of the department. We used to have stats on many low-cost size schemes provided to individuals and AHPs. That, that hasn't uh, turned up anymore. So that, that scheme now uh, does seem to be inactive at this stage. So now we're trying to get something uh, similar to that reactivated. To, firstly, to, to have the sites that were mapped by the housing agency uh, almost move them on to their status are they eligible for housing? What's the time scale? Is there any debt on the site? So it's basically moving off in inventory to detail about what's available for AHBs to develop. So um, obviously the housing agency and the local authorities will have to negotiate with that in terms of what's the next phase for AHBs because obviously sites are key. We, we've got a lot of sites in recent years here from the development sector and whether it's through receivers or private owners, that, that, has, that has been a supply chain. But that's all night at the moment, and some of the things have been sold on to third-party investors. So that niche we had for the last four years uh, was very much working with private developers and the private sector to get uh, some, uh, as Deputy Red said, what can you bring to the table in relation to schemes. Some of those schemes were low-cost schemes through NAMA or private developers. But, uh, but the, land, the land issue is, is a key factor for to move the supplier. The sector's ambitions for the larger bodies is around 5,000 homes over the next two to three years. Now, they think that the capacity to even provide more and to manage, but obviously they'd like to know or get visibility on sites ahead so they can plan with the boards to find out what finance they need for, say, the next five to seven years. Thank you. Sorry, Deputy Coppinger. Um, yeah, if there's to be an increase in the, in the amount of public housing that's to be built, which obviously I, I would hope there will be, uh, the question is who's best placed to do it. And um, I can completely understand why housing agencies cropped up related to niche areas, to use that expression, like elderly people, disabled people, people who understood the needs of that sector. But what's happening now lately is housing agencies are being given the lion's share of public house building. And that's something that I've questions about because, and I think um, that's what was being referred to because um, it seems to me that it's obviously related to the financial issue because of this off-balance sheet thing, uh, the EU fiscal rules, but also I'm questioning whether it's ideological as well. Um, one of the problems with housing agencies versus local authorities would be, as somebody you know, who was on a council for a period of time, one of the things I found dealing with the housing agencies who were increasingly being given housing estates in the area is that councillors aren't in a position to represent any of the people living in those estates like they are with the council. And that's a real disadvantage for those people in those houses because you've nobody to bat on your behalf. At least with councils, you can go in and argue about rent, about arrears, about antisocial behaviour, whatever it is. There's a couple of, I just mentioned three things, like um, Pyrite, which a housing agency in my own area respond hasn't done anything about. If that was the council, I'd be best placed to go in and make representations, but I haven't gotten anywhere. Um, things like replacement of windows. We've got housing estates in Mulhudard that are controlled by, you know, NABCO and others. They haven't done window replacement. The, the tenants are in freezing cold houses, you know. So at least with the councils, there's a process there. And there's a certain democracy as well. Um, what, the thing I have a problem with is it seems to be the councils are having to hand over their land to housing associations. That's what's happening. Um, 
because, like in again, mention my own Dublin West, we've a massive housing crisis, a massive homeless crisis. There's going to be 22 houses built in the document, the, you know, laying the foundations, only 22, and it'll be Cluid Housing Agency. Now, they will be just for generalised population. So why is a housing agency being given all these estates when it's not a specialised group that's going to be in them? You know, so that's, let's be clear here. Th these aren't housing associations batting on behalf of a, a sector that's kind of, you know, needs proper care, like a loan used to argue for... The elderly. So the question. Maybe yeah. we can give them an opportunity to respond. I'll, I'll start with Justin. Maybe the, the first part, Deputy. Uh, the either or ask. You are, you know, clearly saying either or. Local authorities or HBs. I wouldn't see it. Personally, I wouldn't see it as either or. Obviously, the, the bulk still of the capital funding is the local authorities, and you can see that in even in terms of the output, in terms of construction and and acquisition. It's, at the moment, it's it's local authorities have the bulk of the capital, not HBs. We've we've only about 30% capital funding. We have a capital assistance scheme which is 70 million for the country, and 30% capital, which is about under CAF, which is about, what, 30, 40 million. So the, the bulk is still with, with, within local authorities. At the moment, it's not with HBs. We play, initially, we played a complementary role. But in, in addition, we provide more family type housing. It took people off, more off the wait list. Obviously, all elected members have people on the wait list. And whether it's through elect, local authorities or approved housing bodies, I'm sure elected members want people off the waiting list. And that's one thing that uh, HBs think they can offer. They can in some cases, they may have to acquire the properties, go and talk to receivers to maybe buy them different estates. But they do take people off the waiting list. That's their, that's their key motivation, is to house people. It's not to, and in some cases, they do, need, they do need sites. In recent years, I'd say more of the sites have been provided by the, maybe the private sector. In the past, it was maybe religious bodies or local community organisations would provide sites. So that would have been the, the path for land. But I don't see it as an, an either or. Like, we have a housing crisis at the moment. And we have to put every all hands to the pump, whether it's local authorities or HB. We, we don't want to be competing uh, for uh, to people off the wait list. We th we've, uh, we've also got a regulator, two regulators at the moment. We've a regu regulator for landlord tenant relationships with the RTB. We're moved on to the RTB now. So these tenants have remedy the end towards the RTB if there are any issues. So that, that's one positive thing for the landlord tenant relationship. Also, in relation to the organisation's regulation, we have a new regulatory structure. In, in place over the last couple of years. It'll be probably statutory from next year. So in terms of a, uh, that level of accountability, it'll be, it'll be public. It'll be a public, hopefully, independent regulator for the sector. So you'd have regulation for the organisation and regulation for the landlord-tenant relationship. And that's, that's important to build up confidence from everybody uh, in the sector, elected like members and others. Uh, just new yeah, just to add, I mean... And, and I to compliment some of what Donald said, I mean, the regulator... Well, we are meeting the same housing need. All the people we house comes from the local authority waiting list. They, they give the names to us. We interview. We agree to selection with them. So we're meeting a public need for housing. We are a dedicated kind of housing body. Under the regulation, I think this is very important, particularly for the larger tier three associations. As part of the regulatory compliance, we have to do a 30-year asset management plan and get that verified and get it approved by our boards so we know the money we need to set aside for the replacement of component parts of housing. That's windows, roofs, whatever else it is. That's what we have to do as part of a business modelling. So I think we're probably more disciplined than that in local authorities because the truth is local authorities' rents go into the central coffers of local authorities, don't always go back into housing. So all the money we get on rent we use to maintain and manage the properties. I think the indications would be that the key performance indicators we have are generally better than what local authorities have, but the people operate in different contexts. So in that sense, I think, you know, I, I take the issue of what you said, and I can't speak for the bodies you referred to. You know, to me, I can only speak for my own association, Circle of Voluntary Housing. If a public representative contact me with, a, with, a, with an issue for a constituent, I would respond to it. I mean, it's just me. It's just part of what I would have to do. Uh, I respect the right of a public representative to do so, and you try to respond back and give an explanation as to the housing need where the person is, or as if there's a complaint about maintenance issue of what you're trying to deal with it. Now, that does occur. So I'm just saying it's not to, um, as it were, delegitimise the rights of public representatives to advocate on behalf of, of, of the people that we house or the people they represent. That's that's not the space we're in. I'm just saying that, right? Um, so that would be how the context of which we have to operate. Um, 
It, and as, just to affirm what Donna said, it's not either or. I mean, if we have the capacity to get funding from one source and the local authority have it, to get, they have to rely entirely on public funding. Uh, if we, you know, we, we're trying to work together in terms of broadening the funding regime to deliver the needed social housing. If, if the CAF and the payment availability works, you know, for every 30% the department puts in, uh, we'll have to raise the other 70%. That's a better value money equation for the state in terms of new provision. And if there are limits on, on, on the government balance sheet of, of the capital spend, that is a serious factor that's facing the country and it affects us as AHBs as well. I mean, that's why the capital programme was decimated from 2008 to 2015. It only began to slightly increase in 2015, uh, but it was, was decimated, both for local authorities and for us. Okay. The questions you raised, there's an element of it that we will specifically, I think, follow up when we're doing the finance section, because some of those points. Thank you, Mr. O'Brien. Deputy Function. Um, thanks, Chair. Yeah, I suppose I just wanted to ask in relation to the cooperation between the local authorities and the voluntary housing sector. Like, I know the way it works in terms of you get your, your, your list from the housing list, but I find then if you have a situation where somebody is needing a transfer, maybe on overcrowding or medical grounds, that there's no sort of inter-transferability, for want of better words. I, mean, I don't know whether that's a national thing or that's just each local authority kind of deciding themselves, but I know we certainly don't have that, where if you have somebody, let's say, for example, a respond has a bungalow accommodation that would be suitable, and you have someone in a local authority house, there doesn't seem to be any room for to be kind of inter-transferred there. And I would have to agree with um, some of the points Deputy Coppinger raised in relation to that it may be being a little bit more difficult to deal with some of the, the housing authorities over or the housing agencies over the actual local authority and in terms of some repairs, I know we have a, a particular situation with the with heating where people are, are expected to, to pay for the central heating to go into their homes themselves and that would be very different in a local authority home. So there there can be some difficulties there. I know you're you're not um maybe can't comment exactly on, on individual cases, but I do think that should be something to, to bear in mind, that there, there is a, maybe a, a better approach needed in terms of dealing with both tenants and the public reps that are speaking on their behalf. But my, my main question, I suppose, really is in relation to the, the fact that the list, while well, there seems to be good cooperation there at the start when you're taking the, your, your names from the local authority list, after that then there doesn't seem to be a chance for you know, intertransferability, which in some situations it make a lot, a lot of sense if that was the case. I'd just respond in a more as a housing practitioner in terms of uh, the issue does present itself because you house somebody and the family size increases and people are saying they're overcrowded. I think the, I think the context is that both for the AHB and the local authority there is not a lot of available stock for transfer as it were, right? So it, it, is, it is a bit of a problem. Some of that is just about capacity. What tenants sometimes do, and you advise them to do it, would be, is, you know, sometimes people want to go from one location to another, or to downsize, or to upsize, as it were. Sometimes there would be an agreed mutual transfer arranged with the tenant, by the tenants, with the sanction of the approved housing body and the local authority. That, I mean, we've done that numerous times, and, you know, you... you Basically, each, each respective person would interview the potential new tenant and agree it, work out that there's no rent arrears or you're transferring an antisocial tenant from one place to another. You, you know, you have a process on it. But I think the biggest problem for us all, even within our own stock, if families increase in size, you're, we, the capacity we have to uh, re-let, you know, to re-transfer people from a smaller size unit to a larger one is limited. Uh, I mean... Generally, in most local authorities and in AHBs, the turnover of tenancies is very, very limited. So, therefore, the capacity is limited to enable what the kind of situation you're outlining. Can I just clarify then that it's, yeah. it's not policy not to transfer between local authority and... Because that's been my experience to date, and I'm just wondering... That, so it does actually happen where you can transfer... Well, it, from, well, it happens to two ways. I mean, one would be where tenants try to make the arrangements and then it's done with the approval of each respective body, right? Yeah. Sometimes a local authority might, might say, well, this person's already housed, their housing need has been met with, why should we enable it to put them back on our list? You know, they're deemed housed. Yeah. You will have a conversation with them about the size issue or other factors to come into. There could be medical issues, there could be antisocial issues. You know that you're saying to the local authority, can you help me out here? Uh, because 
there's risk here and you know you, you make those kind of exchanges but that would be the context of it okay yeah Thanks. okay thank you Yes. I just want to, to make the, the broader point, and I think it, it just comes back to um, us as a federation and our members. And I think um, in, in order just to, um, to raise awareness about the role, the functions, the accountability and the governance of the sector, and certainly we, um, we've been um, reaching out to all the housing SPCs and to, to, to put ourselves in front of the housing SPCs, open, opening us, ourselves up um, to any questions and any issues that are arising for that particular local authority. And um, we, we have written to the chair of every housing SPC because I do think part of um, part, part of what we're trying to do is to, um, I suppose, to, to emphasise the, um, the, what the, the added value that the um, housing associations um, can be um, and also the partnership approach with local authorities and also some of the, um, some of the issues that elected members are facing um, in particular areas and also just to try and clarify some of the questions about the sector and about in particular, your issue about well, you know, the policy, you know, for local authority tenants and um, tenants of housing associations. So, part of this, as well as to try and, um, you know, increase the awareness and the operation of the sector in terms of how it, it works in conjunction with local authorities yeah, as well. That's good. I think that's a good idea. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Deputy Quinlivan. Thanks, Conor. Like, um, most of my questions have been asked already by other deputies, so just briefly, on 2.4 of your submissions there, cutting through the red tape or whatever you talk about, a special purpose vehicle, maybe you could explain what you what, what you'd envisage that could do. For instance, um, I, I'm aware of a project we did in Limerick whereby Clue was, was able to provide uh, sheltered housing, and that freed up other, no, unfortunately those houses were demolished, but you could do it in a way where you could free up houses that we could re reallocate or whatever on there. You know, a different program or whatever. Would you envisage something like that we could do, or what would you envisage in it? Thank you. Okay, there, there, there are probably a couple of issues. Uh, I'll start with in terms of the, the purpose vehicle. We've been involved in this for the last three or four months to try and get a financial vehicle, uh, basically to, to bring more finance into the sector that is off the balance sheet of the state, but also off the balance sheet of the housing association because they're carrying debts on their balance sheet. Now, initially, we looked for it. There's a Welsh model we were looking very closely at. The Welsh model, five associations set it up, and they drew a lot of money in from financial bodies, and they acquired properties. They acquired properties in the private market, and that worked well. So we're looking at that a financial vehicle draws money in from uh, in the investment sector, pension funds, credit unions, and then they, they lend out to housing associations at a very favourable rate. So that was the overall context. Now, obviously, with, with any financial model, we can have plenty of finance, but no product, and that's what we were... Uh, facing that there's loads of finance floating around now. This is a more structured vehicle, but there was no product in the private sector. So we're looking at maybe even with joint ventures with the private development sector. If they have product, then we can use that that finance to acquire those units. And also, we, we obviously we, we had discussions in Limerick City Council in relation to regeneration with a number of associations, and we've been down uh, for the sector for a couple of years to see what what role we could help in Limerick in, in spreading your rege regeneration. And that again could be used. With, uh, the loan finance, the mixed funding regime. So it has been considered in relation to things like you mentioned, Deputy, as well as the wider context of drawing finance into the sector. Uh, look, look, at the end of the day, we have a huge you know, ask on all of us, 35,000 homes to be produced by, what, 2020 or ever. The local authorities look to play a role. We can play a role. We, that's, we have to use these different vehicles to draw money in. Uh, and they're new vehicles. It can be complex, but... Uh, people working on the dam is to, to get these solutions in place for the like of Limerick and others, both for regeneration and for new build uh, and acquisition. But, but we do need product, and this is come back to your deliberations, Chair. We, we depend on the private sector being active. There's no point in the private sector being non-active. We can't buy product off the private sector. So, so we're all intertwined in terms of failures in the housing sector. So hoping your deliberations, you reflect the fact the private sector does. Uh, affect, affect us as well in terms of new supply. But we are, say we are, we're sad at the moment, Deputy Quinlan, in the way of, we went very close to having a model together. To, we don't want to over egg it and do it prematurely. We want to tie down and get the people committed, the association committed, and then show people it's not just talk, it's actually something we've achieved. So hopefully in the, in the next uh, couple of months we'll have something concrete. Uh, but we're still working in, in the association, working on Limerick to try and assist Limerick in the regeneration programme. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Wallace. Uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, just uh, uh, to follow up, um, uh, just one point, and I mean, most of the questions have been asked. Um, 
I mean, will I be right in saying that there's been a proliferation of approved housing bodies since the crash in 08? And uh, it's, it's maybe sad for you that has coincided with probably our worst handling of uh, supply of housing in the history of the state. But uh, I, I get the impression, um, uh, listening to your, for want of a better word, your defence of the questions put, um, would it be true to say that if local authorities were actually given sufficient access to funding and were better resourced and better staffed, uh, there would be no need for the housing bodies? <coughs> well, thanks everybody for that. Uh, can address, I, I, <coughs> I'm only asking. But, but, <laughs> but go now. No, just to answer your, your first question now in relation to proliferation, well, they're actually having us went the other way. There's been massive consolidation since 2008 because prior to that, there are a lot of associations getting capital grants or loans to provide housing. After that, uh, the crash, that didn't happen. So we, we had a lot less bodies being set up. Very few bodies have been set up in the last what, five, six, seven years as new housing associations. Some have come together and merged other local voluntary bodies or bigger bodies. That they've come together. So that it's went the other way, actually. Because of the downturn in the capital funding, there are less associations providing new housing anymore. There's probably about 15, 20 under, under the mixed funding private finance and about another 20, 30 on, on the, the CAS scheme. So it's actually, ironically, uh, went the other way, that there has been much more consolidation. And with the regulation now as well, the multiple layers of regulation, I, I suspect that will increase. There won't be, there won't be proliferation, there will be more consolidation uh, in the coming years on that side. Just, do you want to mention well, that? Just to add to it, I mean, like my own association, Circle of Voluntary Housing, we were set up in 2003 with 1,000 units we own and manage. I know if we were set up now, we, we, wouldn't get it. we couldn't get a start-up. We'd need serious financial clout. Uh, to start to enable us to develop. It's relatively impossible. It is really difficult for a new association without backing to, to, to develop. And the truth is there's very few new associations looking for membership at the Irish Council for Social Housing at the moment because the context of delivery at the moment is really, really difficult. I mean, 15 years ago, you could get a start, you get a 100% capital grant, you'd grow it. That's not the case now. It's totally the opposite. Um, I mean, the other, the other question is as well, if local authorities are doing everything right, what's our purpose for being right? Uh, is kind of, I, I, without, well, I think, I think there's an honest conversation about this in terms of, um, you know, it's not to, we're, I'm not trying to dismiss local authorities. They've delivered social housing uh, over the lifetime of this state. <coughs> A considerable amount of social housing being sold on to people and have owned their own homes via that process and the political choice that's made. We see ourselves as complementing uh, the provision of social housing in the country. That's our main purpose. We believe that we're more single-purpose organisation that's dedicated to that and enhancing our ability to do it. Whereas sometimes in the local authorities, they, you know, people, there's often a change of personnel uh, between people from one section to another. Uh, as I said, the, you know, the, we believe that with funding that's there, we can add value and we can grow the, what's there. It's not one against the other, right? And if you look at most North European countries, uh, Holland, uh, Germany, France, the United Kingdom, you've got that, and it's been done different in different ways within those countries, but you've got a fairly vibrant social housing sector, uh, you know, approved housing sector alongside public housing bodies, and they're meeting social housing need. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Deputy Durkin. Thank you, Chairman. Well, like Deputy Daly, I don't want to be pejorative, and it's, no, it's not my wish to be in any way offensive, but I think you are now looking at what is the, the kernel of the housing situation in the public sector in this country. I have a long, for a long time been an opponent of the replacement of the public sector building programme, as has been suggested by Deputies Daly and Coppinger, uh, with the, how, the voluntary agencies. The voluntary agencies are ideally placed to deal with the sheltered housing and the special needs. There are no better bodies. The local authorities are not even in the same league and couldn't and never could do it. And there are reasons for that. But in relation to the delivery of the main thrust of the requirements of local authority type housing throughout the country, it is the wrong vehicle. And if we continue along this road, in five years time, Chairman, you'll be sitting in that same spot discussing the same issue. And the European Union was wrong to put the emphasis. But it wasn't the European Union. It was by agreement with the Member States. 
the member states agreed in order to get this uh, the off balance sheet situation that you would that we would have this vehicle that was going to deliver housing it do, it doesn't do it and as has been said uh, to go back to the beginning 100% capital grant plus a maintenance grant all of which was available to the local authorities previously so there is a replacement between what the local authorities are doing and what the voluntary housing agency is. I think the biggest housing agency owns about 5,500 uh, houses at the present time in the country, the biggest landlord in the country. But the point that I want to make in, in particular is this. The local authority housing officers will tell you straight out that they are competing with the voluntary agencies for the same funding, coming from the same source. I can't understand for one moment, for instance, how the capital, uh, the capital coming from central government uh, going to the voluntary agency is agreed and quite all right and in accord with all rules and regulations, but the capital funding going to the local authorities to do the same thing is not. And there's no reason for that to be. That, it's a technicality that was introduced for a particular purpose. Uh, to my mind, it was a total and abject failure. And I, I, my, my reason for it is this. In this country, the, the, there was a theory, and there's a theory still going on, uh, and, 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 and a baseless theory, that we should get away from owning houses, and that Irish people were preoccupied with ownership and so on and so forth, and that we would become like the Europeans, where they, 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 they leased or rented their houses. We are not the same, and we don't have the same traditions as people in all areas across Europe, where they have different traditions, and it works very well for them, but it doesn't work here. The Irish person wants to have the potential, first of all, of owning their own house for two reasons. They want to be able to improve it and expand it and call it part of their castle and part of their investment in life. And they can't do that with the voluntary agencies. It's as simple as that. Okay. But the, point, the, point, the point I want to make is this. I, I, want, to, I want to emphasize this, Chairman. Yeah. It is for this purpose that I, that I am sitting here. I am of the opinion that, and I know this because I've, I've dealt with this before, uh, I know that we'll be here in five years' time. And this is no disrespect, disrespect to the housing agencies at all. You are not the appropriate vehicle to deliver the volume of housing that is necessary in this country or in any country with a similar requirement at this or any other time. For the voluntary, for, 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 for the special needs, the sheltered housing, no doubt in the world about that. You are by far and away the best providers there. And we, we get a Macaulay place and various other places like that all over the country. Excellent. We can, we, the local authorities can't compete with that. But I want to tell you, Chairman, if we yes, don't address this issue and deal with it, we're not going to solve this problem. No. Deputy, uh, I'm sorry for interrupting you, but there were two elements there. One, you, you mentioned a number of times in relation to the financing and so forth, and there are questions that we will follow up with the other departments. Um, you, the other comments you make, whether they're the appropriate, that's part of the deliberations as a committee will make. And I suppose what I was trying to get at specifically, as the witnesses were here, have you a direct question that you want to, to ask those witnesses? There are no other direct questions. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> How much more direct do you want to make it, Chairman? Well, I took, I, well, I, 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 took, I took it more as a statement than, a, than as, a, as a, a question. And I want to clarify one thing. Uh, this chairman will not be sitting here in five years' time because after the 17th of June, this committee is completed its work. So, like, let's remain focused on the job at hand. Um, would, does anybody want to comment? I, 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 appreciate, I appreciate the comment that Deputy Durkin has made, and it's been made by other members here as a committee, right? And, okay, that's a perception or a view that's been expressed. We have to listen to that as a sector. I would say, and, and it was said earlier by Donal, we provide currently 30 thousand, over 30,000 units of accommodation. The perception of us is that we're mainly geared or gifted to provide special needs housing for the elderly, the homeless or people with learning disability. The vast majority of the provision we do is family housing. That's the truth of it. It's about, I would say, 75% of what we do. 70%, right? So we have, we are delivering, right? I think there are issues and I, we, let's be it's not that we're trying to take away from local authorities. We're trying to add a different. We're trying to add value. We think we have a specialism, and our key performance indicators are good, and it's working, complementing with the local authorities, right? The and it's also the case. And when you go through the finances, the bulk of funding that's been given for the cap of the programmes over the last ten years has mainly gone to local authorities, not to approved housing bodies. That's the truth of it, right? Where we have to compete with it. That's, there's truth in that too. We're also trying to secure money from other sources of government balance sheet to enable delivery to meet public housing need. 
that model has worked effectively in other North European countries. Can I, can, 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 I, can I give you an example, Chairman? Can I give you an example? Very briefly, I, all right, well, This is a classic, classic example. I, I was involved in, in, a, in, a, in a voluntary housing body that was set up specifically to provide, say, 100 houses, whatever the case may be. We, but we, 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 we had to buy the sites from the local authority, 20,000 each, 20,000 each. The voluntary agencies got the sites for zero. The voluntary agencies got the sites for zero. Now, that's competition. We were doing the same job, but we were doing it for the people to acquire their own homes. The local authority gets a, 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 a sum in respect of, of maintenance or whatever the case may be. So do the housing bodies. And I'm not, I don't want to be uh, in any way pejorative about this. It is a fact of life that the two are competing. And it, this, the model has failed. But more importantly, more importantly, of, the capital allowance scheme, 100% capital funding. 100% uh, uh, funding of the, for the site, 100% funding for the loan to build the houses, and, 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 a ca and, and, and a grant there afterwards for the maintenance of the houses. So I, I could go on and on, but I'm not going to. You'd be glad to know, Chairman. You'd be glad to know. If there was a single issue, and, and the, the, the perception, I, well, I didn't say that now. I, I, I said that the voluntary agencies are better equipped at yes. dealing with the special needs and the sheltered housing than anybody else. There is no doubt about that. But they are not the proper vehicle to provide the volume of housing that is required through the local authority system. And that's why in the 80s we didn't have a problem. And it was as a result of the changeover that we now have the problem we have. Just, uh, just two points, and Deputy Mac, uh, Mr. McManus, I'll let you re before I let you reply, some of those issues we will be pursuing with other departments, but I, I want to hear what Mr. McManus has uh, to say. I just want to Thank challenge you, Deputy, Deputy Durkin that the model has failed you know, on that, that side. We have a lot of schemes, a lot, lot of local authorities come to housing association to manage their properties. If that's an evidence of failure, then I, I don't know where we are, but they have said the housing association, you can manage the properties. Uh, and that has happened in terms of measuring what, what failure. I, I don't think there's a huge demand for housing association properties in many areas, with the like the standard of management uh, that's provided to tenants. I think that's, that's not a failure. Otherwise, in the past, we've had local authorities come to us to regenerate their own properties. Like some of the, and, and, and to be truthful, there were failures in local authorities over the last 30 years. There's been multiple regenerations in various schemes. You know, in, in different local authority areas, and the state has to pick up the tab, and the, and the sector says it could have a, a role in reducing that. So, I uh, would challenge the fact it has been a failure. Maybe, maybe from some people it's a failure, but certainly for ten tenants who are living there, I, I'd say the tenants there would, wouldn't claim that was, that was a failure. You know, that's what, and that's, that's, it, they're the people that matter. We, at the have, end of the we, day. we have nearly 8,000 people yeah. in our housing yeah. list in Kildare, so I wouldn't you, think it's a success. You, you've had a fair hearing on I'm sorry, Dr. Chairman, no, but if, if, I, uh, the, if that particular issue is an issue that's a burning issue with the people that I represent. So. I, and not De my view, Deputy, but I'm, I'm not, you've made the point and I'm not dismissing it. I'm also saying there will be other uh, meetings where the same issue will need to be teased out further. Deputy Canny, please. Thank you. Uh, uh, first of all, I must apologise that I wasn't here at the start. I was at another meeting and um, I welcome you here. I suppose just a little bit of positivity about the housing um, agencies is that in my experience, uh, the housing agencies in my county where I know that they are involved in projects, that they are way better equipped to carry out the management of the housing stock when it's in place. I have proof of accommodation that was built probably in 2000. It's as good today and as well kept today as it was when it was built because I was involved in the construction of, it, of them. And I think the local authorities have failed to... Sorry, the, the local authorities have failed... The local authorities have failed uh, to maintain their housing stock as good as what I see uh, the housing agency do. And it seems to be down to resources, and I don't know where uh, it falls. How you fund? I, I was, I was. Um, you were saying there about whatever rent roll you get, you use that for maintenance and future work. Where the local authorities, when they get in the rent roll, they put into central funds, and it dissipates to whatever. And, and then, because if we build, we can build all the houses we're talking about, but if we don't maintain them, we'll be back, back at it again. And I see it in my own county where we built houses about 20 years ago, and we've probably been knocking them now to rebuild them again. And that's not 
the way we want to be going on in the future. So we have to look at the housing and the whole way we, we, we the estate management. And I, uh, the question I have on that is, do we have, let's say, obviously you have um, a way of doing the estate management that obviously the local authorities don't. Could you, uh, would you be willing to share that expertise with the local authorities so that we genuinely protect our housing stock? That's the first question. Um, the second question, one of the issues I have with housing associations, and you mentioned it there about the housing list, that you get a list of prospective tenants from the local authority and that you pick from that, which I think is wrong. I think if the local authority has a housing list and you have 20 units, that they give you 20 families to go into them and that should be it. As a, as a housing association, you shouldn't have uh, the veto on who you let into the house. And I think that's something that has to change. That's basically it. Mr McManus or Okay, uh, just to say, I mean, firstly, uh, Deputy Candy, thank you for, the, uh, for your acknowledgement of where you think we... <laughs> <laughs> of where we think we, we have we have reasonable performance and and you know and, and that's and that's affirming uh, uh, and just to recognise that and I was trying to express that earlier in terms of saying that we are a single purpose you know we're primarily housing providers so that's where the resources go it is the truth that within local authorities the rents goes into the central fund and it's. And there has been, and Donald alluded to it, there has been issues where some stock hasn't been well maintained over the years. We, for under the regulation code that we have, and this is a really important point, we have to have an asset management in place that's verifiable, that our board sign off on, that we have to adhere to. We have to make provision for it financially. So there's strictures upon what we can and we can't do. To, in terms of um, the... Yeah, I mean, look, it's not that we... I mean, in terms of sharing expertise... That's an important one. We'd be very, very open to that. It's not that we are the best boys in town all the time and know everything. People work in different contexts. It would be very good to get that sharing of expertise. Uh, I mean, for people working in our sector, there is relatively more insecurity, particularly with, age, with, with, with housing bodies starting off before they get reasonable economy of scale, as against the local authority. You know, so... You know, and sometimes people have gone from the AHB sector into the local authority system and there's a bit of transfer over the other way now, which is very, very good. I, I think it would be maybe through the SPCs is trying to look at the enhanced learning. Well, you know, if an SPC said, well, what works, what doesn't work in a local area? How could this learning on this be translated so for the common purpose, right, of, sh of shared intelligence, right? I think that really would be sensible for each SPC to undertake. In terms of the... Of, of the nominations and the selection. I mean, the context of that, and this is how my association, we try to operate it, you tr you, 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 you're getting the top people on the list from the local authority. You're trying to get, rather than like to do in the UK where you just simply take people, you're, you're trying to get a balance within your scheme. Sometimes the waiting list is very, very blunt. So you're trying to get, what we always try to do is get a mix of ages, a working, non-working, ages of children, ages of adults. So it's not all lumped with one and there has been experience, it's particularly in the Dublin area, where some schemes got overloaded with the same category of person in the urban areas in particular, and it's had disastrous social consequences because the communities became unbalanced, they were socially deprived, and then it becomes very, very difficult to manage. So there is some effort. It's not, you know, I mean, it's, it's not a... You're, you're not trying to cherry-pick, to use that word, which is often said against us. My approach to it is we're trying to get a balanced community of where of the 20 units or the 50 units or whatever it is, so there's some vibrancy within it. So I don't know if that gives you some <coughs> clarification on the question you asked. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, ju just before we conclude the meeting, um, to I suppose just to clarify the point uh, that earlier on in the meeting you agreed to supply information to the committee in relation to the query raised by Deputy Daly. Uh, Staffing and salaries well, and premises you, and that kind of you, thing in you particular. You might do that by means of correspondence oh, to the yeah. committee. Just, just to, um, in terms of Deputy Daly's uh, question, um, one of the things we can provide was the, um, and it, it was a publication by the regulation office, which um, it provides a commentary on the sector from the first round of regulatory returns. And, and in that, there is um, a section which does break down the staff in a 
across each tier, but certainly we'll, um, we'll, we'll come back to you on that in detail. Premises and salaries and that kind of thing, I think, will be illustrative as well. That's great. Yeah, thanks. Before we conclude then, um, thank you for your contributions uh, today. Um, I think you heard a, a significant range of questions and contributions on all sides, um, and much appreciated. So very uh, grateful for your attendance and your cooperation. And so thank you, Mr. O'Brien, Mr. McManus, and Ms. Gallagher. Um, the meeting is now adjourned until Tuesday next. Uh, that's the 3rd of May at 10:30 a.m. So enjoy the bank holiday Monday and be in here sharp on Tuesday morning. Thank you. Thank you.